All right, so for our first video, we're going to just go back and review what we've done in optimization so far. So where we left off was basically right here. But let me just uh, go through it very quickly just to kind of remind us what we've been discussing uh, since it was you know, several weeks now. So uh, obviously we're talking about it, optimization. And fundamentally, optimization is based on calculus. So if we have a function of one variable, so a function of x, say, it has minima, it has maxima, it has stationary points, all three of which are where the slope is zero, and then it also has roots where the function itself is zero. So fundamentally, when we're looking for optimal points, we're looking for minimums or maximums, or sometimes stationary points, but more often a minimum or a maximum. One of the key connections that we made was that the minimum or maximum of a function f of x, which is going to be our objective function, is actually a root of f prime of x, because where f prime of x is equal to zero, of course, is the definition of a stationary point, which may also be a minimum or a maximum. So we'll make use of that connection when we apply, for example, Newton's method to find such optimal points. So we first discussed nonlinear programming, and that just simply means that either the objective function itself, which we denote by a j, that's our f of x, and there more, may be more than one design variable. So that may be a nonlinear function, and or the constraints may be nonlinear as well. So the key terminology, again, we have the objective function. That's the thing that we're trying to minimize most often or sometimes maximize. And that's our j, which is a function of the design variables. And then these x variables, those are design variables. That's what we're looking for. Those are the quantities that we're seeking in order to determine for what values of the design variables we get in optimum in the objective function. So for unconstrained optimization, so that just means we're looking for minimums and maximums in the function itself without any constraints. Again, this simply follows from calculus. We use the example of data from the from a car. So this was a fuel economy for a car at different speeds. And we first fit a curve to it. We used a cubic polynomial, so a third order polynomial. We fit to that. And that was our objective function, which we then differentiate to get the uh, minimums, or in this case, maximum. And so we could do that analytically in this case because it's just a quadratic. We could find the two values of x that uh, are roots of f prime of x and then determine the one that makes sense to choose as the maximum. Or we could use a root finding technique such as Newton's method where, again, rather than finding roots of f of x, we're now finding roots of f prime of x. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So here is the, the value that we found was the optimal speed at which to drive to get the best fuel economy. Then we talked about multidimensional objective functions. So rather than just f being a function of x alone, it could be a function of x and y in this case, or even more functions as the case might, uh, sorry, design variables as the case might be. So here we have a two-dimensional function with two minima and one maxima here. There's saddle point somewhere in here as well, where the slope is zero. We did some examples. I won't go over those again. Uh, and then we talked about two methods for numerically determining the minimums in a multidimensional objective function. The first was the method of steepest descent. And it's literally like rolling a ball or marble down into the well to find the minimums. And it's, it's fine, it's robust, but it's not terribly efficient. And so then we came back to Newton's method, which we discussed for finding roots of, of these functions. And it works just as well for finding minimums and maximums because of, again, this connection between the roots of f prime of x are the same as the stationary points, minimums and maximums of the f of x itself. So we can do that for systems of algebraic equations. We discussed that in the last chapter. And we introduced the Hessian matrix. Remember, the Hessian 
is a matrix that consists of all the second derivatives of our objective function. And that led to the second derivative test. So just like in one dimension, you have the second derivative of the function determining the curvature, and the curvature determines whether it's a minimum or maximum or neither. There is a, uh, an analogous extension to multidimensional functions called the second derivative test, and it's based on the Hessian. And then we discussed, started to discuss constrained optimization. This is essentially where we left off uh, before spring break. So there are two types of constraints. There's equality constraints and inequality constraints, which are exactly what they sound like. So an equality constraint says that there is this particular relationship between multiple design variables that has to be satisfied. It satisfied. It has to be faithfully upheld. An inequality constraint says that there's limits on certain design variables or relationships between those design variables. And we'll talk about examples of both of those. So first we looked at equality constraints where we use the method of Lagrange multipliers. And essentially the method of Lagrange multipliers converts a problem where we have a objective function, which we want to minimize, say, subject to a constraint. We augment the objective function with the constraint using Lagrange multiplier. And by doing so, we convert that constrained problem into an equivalent unconstrained problem that we can solve using basic calculus techniques as we did before. So we did the example of an ellipse. So we had an equation for the ellipse and we wanted to determine the semi-major and minor axes of that ellipse. So the maximum distance from the origin and the minimum distance from the origin, but subject to the constraint that the points were on the ellipse itself. So we did that example and it ended up being an eigenproblem. We also looked at this example where we had the maximum bending stress in a beam. And so we had a circular shape with a particular radius, in this case, 10 inches. And we said, well, what's the size, the optimal shape, so height and width of a rectangular cross-section beam that would be able to withstand a maximum bending stress as long as it fits within that circular shape? So we looked at that, uh, again, using Lagrange multipliers. So we denote Lagrange multipliers using a capital lambda to distinguish it from eigenvalues, which are lowercase lambda. Sometimes they are the same, sometimes they aren't. So I like to distinguish clearly between them. And so we found the values of x1 and x2, the width and the height, that give us the maximum bending stress with the rectangular cross-sectional shape that fits within the circular shape. Okay, and then inequality constraints, we're actually gonna punt on this for now. We're gonna use slack variables, and as it turns out, it's not so obvious at this point, but as it turns out, that name actually makes sense. Uh, we'll discuss this in the context of linear programming problems, and we, we apply it the same in nonlinear. But as I've said early on, I've been trying to avoid worrying about inequality constraints, which is the hardest aspects of op optimization until basically as late as we can. So learn about the other aspects and then pull in the inequality constraints when we need them. So we'll, we'll deal with that in the linear programming context, which we're gonna look at next. Uh, words of wisdom. So this is um, a general one, not just for optimization, but one thing you should always do, and this is true of any engineering context, not just for computational mechanics, is when you're doing problems, take particular note of any assumptions that you're making, approximations that you're applying, and idealizations as well that you're making. So for example, if you think back to the numerical solution procedure, which we had earlier in the semester, it was this three-step process that takes us from the actual physical problem that we're trying to deal with to a numerical solution. And the, there's the three steps that get us there. We'll be discussing that more when we talk about differential equations uh, in the next several chapters. But if you remember, at every stage, we had to make some decisions. The first one, the first step involved making certain assumptions and idealizations in our mathematical model of the physical system. So the point here that I'm trying to remind you of is just to be aware of, um, keep track of, and have a sense for the effect of the various assumptions and idealizations that you're making. 
And then numerically, we're also making numerical approximations. We're not getting exact solutions to our numerical problems typically. We're our differential equations, for example, we're typically getting those numerically, so we're approximating the solution. And we need to keep those in mind as well, as that will determine then how good or bad our analysis is. And as engineers, that's why we get paid the big bucks, is so that we can make judgments based on how good or bad our analysis is and how that applies to the actual system. And it's actually, this is so true that we often actually classify problems not based on their applications, but based on the class of methods that are used to solve them. So you'll often see if you were to switch majors to another engineering field, you'll see very similar techniques being used, such as Newton's method and many of the other techniques that we've been discussing in this class, but in very different types of applications. So again, the point here is that we, when we go through that numerical solution procedure, we are trying to get the problem in a form, our problem, into a mathematical form that we can solve using standard techniques or techniques that we know we have in our toolbox. So just keep that in mind. It's always good to keep that in mind as you're, as you're doing various problems. Okay, in the next video, we'll start with linear programming and we'll see actually how quite different that is from nonlinear programming.